put your plumb line to understand the doings and the person of God, you walk away saying, I hardly know anything about this vast and grand theme. Stephen Hawking years ago wrote a book called The Brief History of Time. And he goes through all of the intricacies of how he sees the origin of the universe. And in the last paragraph, he says this, I have now told you what. If I could tell you why, I would know the mind of God. It'd have to take the mind of God to explain the why. Why life exists, why we are here in the first place. That is the exhaustive subject. And I want to talk to you briefly this morning on exactly what it means to answer the question of who God is. So let's take the first one, are you not? If I were to give you a blank sheet of paper and give you a pen and begin the words like this, God, are you not? How would you fill it out? How would you fill in the blanks? There are many, many things you might say. You might say, he is my, he is my savior, he is my friend. All kinds of ideas can come to your mind. And yet some of you might say, I don't have a clue. I don't have a clue. As Pastor Peter Tanchi was talking about even in that one statement on raising your children and showing them what Christ can do in and through them, not every child has the privilege of being raised that way. And some children may say, I have no idea what the word God means. So how do we come to this? We come to this first listening to the common person. And I listen to the common person numerous times in my flights. Somebody sitting next to me will turn to me and say, what do you do? And depending on whether I want to have a conversation or not, I answer the question. And if I've got all the energy to answer the question, I will say something like this. I travel all over the world answering people's deepest questions. And then you can just see the wheels are turning. And about 30 seconds later, they say, like what? And I say to them, what is your deepest question? And sure enough, nine times out of 10, they'll tell you something like, what's life all about? You know, why does it happen? Why do we pay? Why do we suffer? And I'll say to them, that's one of the questions. And they'll say, what's your answer? You see, the common person struggles with the issue of God. This is why one of the finest philosophers in the world today, Alvin Plantinga from the University of Notre Dame, he refers to the belief in God as a PBB category, properly basic belief category. It's a basic belief in the masses of humanity. He says you don't even have to prove it to the masses of them. It's a properly basic belief. They don't care to argue about it. They don't want to debate about it. It's deeply entrenched within the soul, a properly basic belief. In India today, in the pantheon of Hinduism, there are 330 million gods. And they're making more of them all the time. That's why they say in the eastern part of the world, you're asking the question, which part, which God to believe in, and the western part of the world, you're answering the question, if there is a God. This properly basic belief is right there, but how do we come to it? Several years ago, Life magazine, on, in a December issue, had the lead article, Who is God? And on the cover was a beautiful picture of a night sky. And then in big white words, Who is God? So I picked up that issue and started to read. Early in the reading, there's, they're interviewing people. And there's a woman, an elderly woman, who's dying of cancer. And she says, I have believed in Jesus Christ as my Savior all my life. He has been my Savior, and now in my cancer, he's been my, in my, my strength and my, my, my sustenance and all. It's a beautiful testimony, only one paragraph. The next one is from a preacher, a minister, who had lived a duplicitous life, lived a dark life in the background, and a publicly preaching life in the foreground, and he now had AIDS. And he said, I've lived a double life, I've lived a lie, 
I have always preached about the Savior in Jesus Christ. This is the first time while I'm living with AIDS and all of my regrets that I find out how gracious and merciful my God really is. Even though I have lived such a horrible life, He has stooped down to pick me up in these last days and to give me inner hope and peace. These were the kinds of testimonials till you come to the editor himself. And the editor says, I don't believe in God at all. God is an idea or an energy or a source. May the the force be with you. That's the idea. You don't want to have a person. You want to have a force because to a person, you have a relationship and an accountability. To a force, you just use the force for your purposes. And so at the end of it, there were so many conflicting testimonials. You just put it aside and say, I didn't get any answers here. So then they talk to philosophers. You can talk to philosophers. And after you begin to read philosophers, you wonder whether they are real people. Do they really care about real things? You know, I had to study a lot of philosophy. And my friend Lee Strobel, who's written the case for Christ and the case for God and so on and so forth, uh, he, he one day contacted me and he said, I have to get even with you. I said, why? He said, my son came to listen to you and now he wants to study philosophy. So I said, is that bad? He said, yeah. I looked at my son and I said, what is the difference between a professor of philosophy and a large pizza. He said, son, do you know the difference between a professor of philosophy and a large pizza? And his son said, I don't know what you're getting at. He said, son, a professor of philosophy and a large pizza, here's the difference. A large pizza can feed a family of four. In other words, a professor of philosophy is not going to feed you. They don't get any money. And philosophers will climb up ideas, and at the end of it all, you say to yourself, I don't understand where they are going. You listen to two philosophers debate the idea of time, and at the end of that one hour, you will probably say, I have just wasted my time. I better head on and go back home. So you can talk to the common person, you can talk to the philosopher. Then you get closer and closer, and you get to the scriptures, and you start reading Revelation. What do you see? Things like this. God is omnipotent. God is omniscient. God is holy. God is immutable. Omnipotent. All-powerful. Omniscient. Knows everything. Holy. Distance away from me. Immutable. He never changes. Cannot be destroyed. They are wonderful, wonderful concepts. And all of a sudden, you say something like this. If he is omnipotent, why have I got cancer? If he's sovereign over everything, why did he allow my baby to die? If he has complete control, why is my body so racked with pain? And all these terms as powerful and meaningful as they are, become almost abstractions when you are going through a lot of heartache and a lot of trouble. I remember one year, one, some, some years ago, in my office, at my, my secretary came to me and said, Ravi, we've got a telephone call from a stranger. I think you should take it. I said, I'll be happy to if you tell me what it's about. She said, it's about a man who's been in an accident and he's totally paralyzed and he wants to talk to you. So I picked up the phone. I said, hello, sir, my name is Ravi. Can I help you? So he says, Ravi, he says, I listen to you on the radio all the time, but I'm calling you from a hospital bed. He said, a few days ago, I went out on a company picnic I'm a father of a few children, and he described how many and so on. He was in his 40s, I think. And he said, I was, we were having fun playing baseball. And I hit the ball and was running around the bases. And uh, being just a fun game, I was running full speed. I didn't realize that the guy in one of the bases was not going to move, and he was a big guy. He had his foot on the base and standing. And as I ran there, I put my head down, hoping he would move. He didn't. I hit him full tilt with my head, and I've snapped my neck. I am paralyzed from neck downwards for life, and I have a young family. So 
So I'm listening to this and I say, my word. And then I said, and you're calling me because? He said, do you pray for healing? So I started to talk to him and discuss with him what we really think of when we think of healing, how we think of it, trying to explain all of this. But what was he saying? God is sovereign. Why has this happened to me? And by the way, I should mention to you, and this is the truth, years later, one of the ladies who was a great supporter of our ministry and was on our advisory council, she said to me, do you ever remember a man calling you from Dallas, Texas, or Dallas or Houston, I forget, about a broken snap neck? I said, yeah. She said he was my brother. She said he was healed. God touched him. Some years later, he was starting to walk again. Just an amazing thing. Now, I don't know how it happened. I don't know what happened. I don't know all the details. And I can honestly tell you, it doesn't always happen. I myself suffered with my back for many, many years. It doesn't always happen. But you see, the moment you are thrown with your back to the wall at a point of tension, all these terms begin to beg for different definitions and different meanings. Sovereign, holy, omnipotent, omniscient, immutable. And so we move from the common person of Jameer experience to the philosopher of ideas, to revelation of how God has chosen to speak of himself. And then we realize that sovereignty can seem tyrannical, but only if it's unbounded by goodness. Holiness is terrifying if it is untempered by grace. Omniscience is taunting if it's uncoupled with mercy. And you've got immutability become tortuous if it's uncertain of goodwill. What we long for is goodness, grace, mercy, goodwill. How do we find all of this? How do we know all of this? See, the Apostle Paul was a product of many cultures. He was a Hebrew by birth. He was a citizen of Rome and he'd studied in a Greek city. A Hebrew by birth, a citizen of Rome, and he'd studied in a Greek city. He, have, he was writing epistles to, the, to all of these cultures and all of these nations after he had come to know Jesus Christ. And it is interesting to me what all he must have had packed into his mind. If you'd asked the Hebrews for what is ideal, they would have said light. The Lord is my light and my salvation. This is the light that lights everyone that comes into the world. If you talk to a Greek, they, they would see the ideal as knowledge. They're the ones who form the universities. If you talk to the Romans, they would have said glory. For the Hebrews, it was light. For the Greeks, it was knowledge. For the Romans, it was glory. These are all ideas, light, knowledge, glory. They are abstractions. Writing to the church at Corinth. The Apostle Paul says this in 2 Corinthians 4, God who caused the light to shine out of darkness has caused his light to shine in our hearts to give to us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ Jesus our Lord. He has given to us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of of Christ Jesus our Lord. All these abstractions get poured into a person. This is the difference. This is the cardinal difference. You know, when I was growing up in India, we used to love to see movies. Indians still love to see movies. One good thing about many of Indian movies, even if you fall asleep halfway through, you have really missed nothing all you've missed is fellows chasing girls around the trees most of the time. We had an Indian comedian by the name of I.S. Johar because when I was growing up, there was no kissing on the Indian screen. You'd never see a kiss on the Indian screen. So somebody wrote to Johar and said, what is the difference between love on the Indian screen and love on the Western screen? He answered in one word, trees. You run around the trees chasing each other. And as soon as you catch up with each other, the scene changes. And of course, there have to be 5,000 songs in all of the movies <laughs> and as many dances. So we used to see a lot of movies. We had a servant in the house whose name was Aramogam, which literally means six faces. Aramogam. Ar is six. Mogam is face. Six faces named after an Indian god. 
So one day my mother put money into his hand and said, would you like to see a movie? And he said, I've never seen one. You know, she said, go and enjoy it. It was a Sunday, his off day. He got on his white shirt, white trousers, polished his black shoes and marched off to the theater. And we saw him going so happily with the money in his pocket. And I waited about three or four hours for him to come back. Saw him coming from a distance. I said, Armogam, how was it? He said, yo, sir. And then he goes on to tell me, I made a big mistake. I said, what happened? He said, I've never been to a movie before, as you know. And I lost my way. And I came late. And I walked into the middle door. And the whole room was dark. I don't know what to do. So I looked at a wall and I saw some lights coming out of holes. And I said, why have I paid money to see lights coming out of holes? And then it took me about 30 seconds to look in the other direction and see faces on the screen. And I started to shout, oh, this is beautiful, this is beautiful. Somebody had to come and silence him and sit him down and watch the movie. You know what I thought? His name was Six Faces, but he only had one. And he was looking in the wrong direction. But all those beams are like some of the religions of the world. They are beams trying to shine on something. And when all these beams come together in truth, they shine on the face of the person called Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. Who is God? Who is God? Listen to Jesus. I want you to listen to Jesus. He is in prayer in John 17. Three times he addresses God. How does he call him? Holy Father, Holy Father, Holy Father. That's who God is. He is holy, He is at a distance. But his father, he comes near as he sends his only begotten son. Do you know what that means? Do you know what that means? I was in a major city of the world <clears throat> a few months ago with my colleagues, and we were speaking to some of the members of parliament and city leaders. And the man sitting two away from me was the chief of police. And he, with all of his medals and uniform flashing, he leaned over and he said to me, you know, Ravi, what you've spoken about today on the values of a culture, he said, let me tell you something. We're about to celebrate Father's Day in our country a couple of weeks from now. He said, I have 18,000 law enforcement officials working under me, 18,000 in this one area I'm talking about we have our biggest difficulty, and I'll tell you why. Father's Day is the loneliest day of the year for them because over 90% of that community, they in that neighborhood, don't know who their father is. 90% of people in that community don't know who their father is. This is at epidemic level globally where the father comes back home to have his thrills and frills and whatever consummates his physical desires and oftentimes is gone and leaves the mother alone to raise the kids. And I wonder so much if the mothers had not been there, what would happen to our world and our society at large in America at least if with this predicament and this problem we are raising a whole generation of young men who have become so violent and so indulgent and so irrational because they've never had a person in the home with strength and character at the same time. In Atlanta, I know a family very well. In fact, the, more, the young man I'm talking to you about right now, I first met when he was only 12 years old when he wrote this letter and that his story is amazing. His name is McKittrick Simmons. In 1989, his father, Greg Simmons, very powerful businessman in Atlanta, very well loved, great investments and all of that. He and his wife, 
Christie had five, have five children. McKittrick is the oldest, four under him. In 1989, the youngest was one year old, and Greg Simmons bought a beautiful property in Highlands, North Carolina. And Greg, the McKittrick said to him, Dad, can we come and see that vacation home? He said yes. So he left his wife, Christy, with the one-year-old baby. He took the other four kids, asked a friend and his son to go with him. And so there there were seven of them, got into his van, and they drove for some hours to go to his Highlands, North Carolina. And while they're in Highlands looking at this, it's a beautiful city, look at this beautiful home of theirs, It'd be the waterfall in there. McKittrick says to his dad, Daddy said, can we go up to the waterfall? And the father said, you know, I haven't gone, gone very close to it. He said, I'd love to see it, Dad. And so they all walk over towards the waterfall. And as he's about to get closest to the waterfall, he puts his arm out, Greg Simmons does for the children, and says, let me check it out first. You stand back. So he takes two or three steps forward, one step too many, the soil underneath him gives way, and he falls down a quarter of a mile to his death. McKittrick and his other brothers and sisters and this friend and young son, fortunately the adult was also there, shattered by what they saw, shattered by it. And of course, they go through all of the police report and all and get back to Atlanta, to their home. Their closest friend were the Whelans, and this 12-year-old boy, McKittrick, writes to the Whelan family. Here's what he said. Dear Miss Whelan, you don't know how much your family has helped produce my father. He admired your husband and you a lot. He would talk about how good your faith was always with God. He tried to be as generous as you all have been to the church and to many other good things. Since his death, the true friends are now revealed. Your family is at the top of our list. You're a great source of energy for my mother and I. My father loved you very much and was always trying to be like you. My father was like one of the three men in the Bible who were given the talents. One went out and invested them and multiplied them. But one went out and took some stock that failed and came back with nothing. The last one buried them and did absolutely nothing with them. All of them returned in a few days, and the Lord was pleased with the two who had tried to multiply them. But with the third man who had come back with the same amount, the Lord was disappointed because he didn't even try. My father multiplied and lost many things, but he was always trying to please the Lord. He got that from your family. You see, my daddy was a risk taker. That's just how he was. Genesis 1.1 says, in the beginning it was God. And what, that, is the most, that was the most important thing for my father. In the beginning of my dad's life, he was something special. He was so brilliant and successful. No one will ever understand why my daddy fell into the waterfall. Please do yourself a favor and don't even try to figure it out. My daddy died for his children. He was making sure it was safe for us to come up. You may hear different things, but only six of us saw it, and only three of us really understand or understood what happened that day. I am one of those. My mother has lost her treasure chest, her husband. Most of the others have lost Greg. You have lost your best friend. My grandparents have lost their son. Forrest, John, and Barbara have lost their brother. But Miss Whelan, I think it is different for me, totally different for me. He was my best friend and my idol. But when I got my last glim glimpse of him falling down the falls, I lost my most prized man on earth. He was my father, my one and only dad. I had a dream three nights ago, Miss Whelan, but it wasn't a dream. My daddy is all right. He told me that himself. Thank you for being a true friend. I love you a lot, McKittrick. Simmons, 12 years old. You know, my kids are all grown up, and one of the hardest things of the itinerant life is that you're gone so much. It's a hazard. But I'll tell you what, the thing that gives me one of the greatest joys is when my phone rings and I hear, Hi, Dad. How are you doing, Dad? We're missing you, Dad. How are the meetings going, Dad? 
My daughter was here for the conference. She's on her way and stopped in at Italy. Two messages within an hour of her landing. I've landed safely, Dad. I'm in my hotel room, Dad. We need this. They need this. My mother-in-law is 96 years old and possibly in her last few days, I don't know, after an accident. And her daughters are around her bed and going there and following and watching her closely. No matter how old we get, we always need our parents because they are our biggest fans. No matter what happens, they will cheer loudest when you succeed and weep for you the most when you're broken. And we have a heavenly Father who loves us, who cares for us, who is God. He is your Holy Father. You can come to Him in a relationship, not connecting with an idea, but connecting with a person. Because as the Word became flesh and dwelt among us full of grace and truth, I find it fascinating when Jesus is dying on the cross, bringing redemption to the whole world, he looks at a young man and points to his mother and says, take care of her. Take care of her. This family idea was instituted by God. It was not good for man to be alone. And I'm saying to you today, there is no other worldview that will tell you what I am telling you. And that's why Bilkis Sheikh, the Pakistani Muslim convert, titles her testimony, I dare to call him father. In Hindi, it's Asmani Bap, heavenly father. I give to you who God is, he offers a relationship with you and calls you as a child to himself. Are you not? Put down the first answer, he is my holy father. Secondly, did you not? Did you not rescue us a long time before when we faced huge enemies? Did you not rescue us? I'm going to ask you a very difficult question and I want you to be honest with yourself. Have you experienced him? Have you sensed his intervention in your life? Do you know he has met you at some point? So many things happen in life. Not this year, but last year. My son Nathan, they were celebrating July 4th. They had, all of, we were out of town, my wife and I. So the kids came to our home to celebrate July 4th and Nathan was grilling some hamburgers, my son. He has a two-year-old daughter. And so she was just a little past over one, but she was standing next to him. And he was frying something on the stove. And all of a sudden, as she tried to get to him, he bent down and flipped the handle of the frying pan and the hot oil just splashed all over. And his daughter's face was covered with that burning oil. And on the phone, he was just sobbing. He said, Dad, I don't know how I did this. I, and this sweet little face is now getting blistered and covered. And of course, they took her to a burn unit. And it's amazing. From what I gather, they heal. And they heal marvelously. But the doctor said to him, you know what, Nathan? I'm amazed that not one drop of that hot oil went into her eye. God was there. God was there. There are times where he puts that hand out and says, I'm going to guard you. You'll be hurt, but I'm going to protect you. And that face, as sweet as it is, restored now with all those blisters and all of those marks gone. In my sermon book, I have a story written in the Reader's Digest. It's a fascinating story. It's the story of a man called Marcel Sternberger who gets into a train in Brooklyn on the subway, and it's the middle of the day. He'd gone to visit a sick friend who was dying. And he visits the sick friend and takes the strain that he doesn't ever take because he doesn't live there. And it's the middle of the day, he's normally at work. And he gets into the train and it's crowded. But as soon as he gets in, one man gets off and there's one seat, he makes a beeline for it and sits down. 
But the man next to him is reading a newspaper with his arms outstretched. So Sternberger is sort of craning his neck away, but he looks at the newspaper and it's in Polish. And Sternberger understood Polish. So he's starting to read it and he notices the man is reading it from the classified section. So he looks at the man and he says, are you looking for a job, sir? He said, no, I'm not looking for a job. I'm looking for my wife. He said, what do you mean? Are you looking to find somebody to marry? He said, no, 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 no. I'm from Hungary, Debrecen in Hungary. And he said, during the war, I was taken away by the Russians to bury the German dead. And by the time I came back, my city had been liberated. But I was not sure whether my wife ended up in a concentration camp in Auschwitz or whether she was liberated. I've had no contact with her. So I've come to America looking for my wife to see if she was liberated and brought here. We have no, con no contact address for each other. And Marcel Sternberger starts to think, you know what? A few days ago, I was in a party. He's talking to himself now. And there was a woman from Debrecen, Hungary, who said she had been liberated by the Allies and brought to the United States. And her husband had been taken by the Soviets to bury the German dead. And he'd written her name down because he said, maybe we'll get together sometime. And he'd written her name down, and then he turns to Sternberger and says to him, what's your wife's name? She said, he says, Maria, Maria Paskin. Sternberger takes out that piece of paper and it says Maria Paskin, phone number. And then she sa he says to her, he says to the man, and what's your name? He said, my name is Bella Paskin. So, Mr. Paskin, please get off at the next station with me. I want to make a phone call for you. He didn't tell him anything. So they get off and they go to a telephone booth. And he dials in, tells the man to stay outside. And after many, many rings, this woman picks it up. He says, who am I speaking to? And she says, Maria Paskin. He says, Maria, do you remember me? My name is Marcel Sternberger. She says, yes, I remember you. He said, Maria, what was your husband's name? She said, my husband's name was Bella Paskin. He said, Maria, you're about to witness the greatest miracle of your life. Hold on. And Bella Paskin comes in and he hands the receiver to him. And he says, hello. And Marcel is standing outside the phone booth and he sees the man slap his forehead and screaming out of control with absolute disbelief, not believing what had really happened. So Sternberger is walking out with tears in his eyes and just thinking of how this all happened. He said, you know what? I don't take this train. I don't live here. How did all this happen? And he, end, he gave the man some money to go and meet up with Bella Maria. And he ends the article with this. The, the man writing the article says this. Skeptical persons would no doubt attribute the events of that memorable afternoon to mere chance. But was it chance that made Sternberger suddenly decide to visit his sick friend and take a subway line that he'd never been on before? Was it chance that caused the man sitting by the door of the car to rush out just as Sternberger came in? Was it chance that caused Bella Paskin to be sitting beside Sternberger reading a Hungarian newspaper? Was it chance or did God ride the Brooklyn subway that afternoon? Do you think you're here by accident? Do you really think you're all, your life is just a compilation of accidents? Or do you think God's brought you here for a purpose this morning? It may be you really don't know him, but deep inside you're wanting him, wanting him very badly and saying, God, if you're real, speak to me. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what heartache you're facing. I don't know what struggle you're facing. But the Lord of the universe in his sovereign grace has brought you here and wants to speak to you and tell you that his love for you is enormous, that he wants to give to you that relationship with your holy Father so that you may know the truth and the truth will set you free. This is the story of the gospel, the word becoming flesh and dwelling among us full of grace and truth. Again and again, I am reminded that nothing in my life has happened by accident. Even the dark moments of bad choices, God has used in a marvelous way for his glory. Are you running from him today? 
in an audience like this, there has to be those who are running. Remember what Francis Thompson wrote, I've led him down the nights and down the days, I've led him down the arches of the years, I've led him down the labyrinthine ways of my mind and in the mist of tears I hid from him. A down titanic glooms of chasmed fears, up with stayed hopes I sped from those strong feet that followed, that followed after. And then he ends his poem by saying, ah, poorest, blindest, meekest, I am he whom thou seekest, thou dravest love from thee that dravest me. When you drive God away from you, you're driving love away from you. Are you not, my holy father, did you not speak to me and want to meet me? Did you not intervene in my path? And lastly, I say to you, he says in the prayer, will you not? Are you not? Did you not? Will you not? Will you not deliver us from this vast army? And God says this, do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army, for this battle is not yours, but God's. I am 99% sure this verse is the middle verse of the Old Testament. The battle is not yours, it's the Lord's. I don't know what you're battling today. It's not yours, it's his. He's fighting it for you. There are so many battles that come upon, we've taken on a big project in our ministry. And I said to my wife last week before we left, I said, boy, I sure hope I've not tried to bite off more than I can chew. I said, this is huge. And she comforted me and said, Ravi, the Lord's brought you this far. He didn't bring you here by accident. He's brought you here for a purpose. He'll provide. He'll take care of what it is we need and you need for this. And so here's my challenge to you. The only way you can say the battle is not yours but his is if he has won the battle in your heart. Do you hear me? If he's won the battle in your heart, then the battle is completely his from there on because he said, I am with you. I have overcome the world. I will equip you. I will empower you. The battle is his once he has conquered your heart. The peace that he brings from knowing that, from you knowing, I can't win this. I really can't win this. And you have to be a person who has faced such battles. I've faced them. When you say, I, I, I can't cope with this, it's too much for me. God says, the battle is mine, not yours. It's at the heart of the Hebrew scriptures. The battle is mine, not yours. And so I say to you today, have you surrendered your heart to him? There's a Muslim medical doctor converted to Christ from Pakistan. I sat next to him at a meeting and at the end of it he told me his story. I don't remember a lot of it. He said, I was a total skeptic, total skeptic. And I went to listen to a preacher one day and I was utterly bored. He said, I listened to nothing he said, but I was glad when he said, I just want to close with two statements. So I was happy the end had come. And then he said this, in surrendering, you win. In dying, you live. He said, I sat up. In surrendering, you win. In dying, you live. He said, I said, God, I've heard nothing of what he said, but those two lines make a lot of sense to me and he surrendered his heart to Jesus Christ and began his new life in God. Wherever you're seated this morning, and what a beautiful crowd, thank you for coming. Are you willing to surrender yourself to him and die today so that he might live in you? In 1939, King George VI spoke to the world on the brink of a terrible war. And he used to stutter and stammer 
but he gave the most powerful speech and he closed in the middle of the speech with these words. I said to the man at the gate of the year, give me a light that I may walk safely into the unknown. And he said to me, go out into the darkness and put your hand into the hand of God. It shall be to you better than the light and safer than the known. A new year was about to dawn when he said this. I said to the man at the gate of the year, give me a light that I may walk safely into the unknown. He said to me, go out into the darkness and put your hand into the hand of God. It shall be to you better than the light and safer than the known. How do you put your hand into the hand of God? With his word. That's his message to you. When you read this word and absorb this word and live by this word, your hand is in his hand. That's how we put our hand into his hand. But we begin by surrendering our lives to him. And I'm going to ask you to bow your heads in prayer with me. And I'm going to ask you to do this not because anybody else is doing it, but because in your heart today you know God has spoken to you and you wish to surrender your life to him, receive him as your savior, and die to yourself so that he might live within you. I would love to pray for you in closing and ask God to just garrison your heart and pour his love into your soul. But if you're willing today to be totally surrendered to him, maybe you've never done it before, but today you say, I'm ready to commit my life to Jesus Christ and put my hand into his hand. Or you're wandering far off, whatever that need, you know you need to turn to him in total surrender. Will you stand if that is your prayer? Don't stand because somebody else is standing, but stand because God has spoken to you and you wish to receive him into your life. Yes standing here on the ground floor. Please do so. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. This is your moment between you and God. Just rise to your feet. And as you stand to your feet, you're saying, Ravi, please pray for me. I have that need for my Savior. I have that need to be surrendered. Upstairs, looking across the balconies, just rise to your feet out there. If that is your prayer and that is your desire, yes, God bless you. I see some of you rising up and the and at the upper tier right up there. I'm going to wait just one minute more. Maybe you're really struggling and you're saying, I, I really don't want to do this. But you know deep in your heart you need to do it. Will you do it? Win that battle for God today? So I'm waiting about 45 seconds. Just rise to your feet and say, yes, I want to be one of these. Pray for me all across the auditorium. Father, I thank you for these men and women, these young people who are at their feet. You can hear the cry of their heart, Holy Father. You know why they are standing and that's all that really matters. But before they leave here, Father, I pray they will talk to somebody and let that person know what has happened in their heart today. That they will talk to somebody from this congregation so that they can be prayed for and begin a new lockstep march with you. Thank you for this morning. Thank you for the music. Thank you for this church and for giving me the privilege of bringing them to you. Are you not? Did you not? Will you not? As your heads are bowed, let me answer the question. Who is God? Who is, he is our Holy Father, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And our hearts are restless until they find their rest in him. He is the God of the past, the God of the present, present and the God of the future is your Holy Father who sent his Son to draw you into his own bosom. That's who God is. May you know him, love him, and follow him. Father, in your sacred name, I commit them to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
You may be seated. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. Part of our worship here as well is that we give to the Lord. If you're here for the first time, we would like to invite you at the Welcome Center as well, located just outside this worship hall. Can I invite everybody to stand up as we respond in worship? And for those who are in need of prayer, you can come forward. The pastors, the leaders are here. They'll be willing to pray for you. So let's all respond as we worship our Lord, as we dwell in His house all the days of our lives.